Thank you. You may be seated. Some of you have been praying that the air conditioner would break because you're always cold in the church service, so it's your fault that it's hot today. Some of you are thinking, this is great. Why is it not always this temperature in the building? But anyway, we're going to get that fixed. We had a brand new pump. We got, I got here about 6 o'clock this morning, and it was about 79 degrees, and I knew that we had a problem. And so I'm grateful that we have folks like Andy Simmons and Mike Emmons I can call and wake up at 6 o'clock and say, 911, we have a problem and I don't know what it is. I can't get it to come on. I did all the things I needed to do, which were not very much. And uh, they came up here and worked feverishly for over an hour and a half trying to get it to work. And it just flat out, the motor is burned up. So we're going to get to do a new one. So, hence the offering is important today. Just going to let you know, we're going to have to buy a pump today. This is for fun. So, but I didn't want to miss today. Uh, we didn't do life groups. We, we knew we would have a difficult time. We didn't want to put preschoolers in rooms that are 80 degrees plus. I didn't think that anybody would be fired about that, workers or the kids alike. And so we decided to punt at the last minute and just do worship. So thank you for your flexibility this morning to do that. We'll get the pump order to get it here uh, by Saturday because Brandon and Megan Harvey have a wedding this Saturday. And so the first thing she wanted to know was we're going to have air on Saturday. And I'm like, absolutely. We'll do something. Or we'll move venues. We'll do something. We're, we'll plan to have it fixed. Uh, so we'll try to get that order tomorrow and uh, get that squared away. We are starting a brand new series this morning, and uh, I had mentioned this is a PG-13 rated series, and talked about letting kiddos uh, step out uh, after the music time this morning. But this morning's, uh, as I prepared this week, um, and actually changed and flip flop what I was doing, um, your kiddos are good to stay today. The next four Sundays we'll talk about, I'll mention those in just a moment. If there may be 10 and below, you might want to consider, depending on where they are, maturity level, uh, you might want to let them go with Denise. They'll have uh, some adults that will be there, and they'll do some extended part of our life group hour. They'll do it during the message time, uh, beginning next Sunday for the next four Sundays. We'll have that available. Uh, the last two of the series, you don't need it. Uh, we're going to talk about race. We're going to talk about social media technology, and most of your kiddos need to hear that anyway. Um, and so we'll talk about that the last Sunday of this series. But I just want to let you know, uh, this is by, by absolutely, and it's not a surprise that Satan would love for us to not start this series today, uh, because this is one of the most challenging sermon series, message series I've ever uh, tried to put together. Uh, it's challenging. The topics we're going to tackle are challenging. And quite frankly, I'm not an expert in a lot of these areas, and so I have had to rely in, on other people that are much smarter in these areas than I am. Some other pastors, uh, some online resources, some other sermons that I've heard and seen. So I'm going to be pulling from a lot of different resources to try to give help towards these particular subjects. We're going to talk about uh, subjects that our culture speaks about, our world speaks about, and Satan is speaking about. But it appears or it feels sometimes that we in the church might not address these issues, at least head on, maybe in a message series. We might perhaps mention it from time to time, but never a concentrated focus on some of these particular issues we want to talk about. And really this began in my heart last year as I began to pray. Um, about this time in the summer, I began to pray about, God, where do you want us to be in the next year? And what kept coming across my desk were some of these topics and statistics about some of these particular issues. And some of these have only been heightened by this particular last year, one of those being abortion, about the different laws that are being passed in the South. This particular issues are, are being passed laws in one way, but you go further north and laws are being passed in the exact polar opposite. And so I wanted to, to really address some of these particular issues. And really what we'll find in this is that sometimes, like on today's series, we don't find the word mental illness in the Bible. But we find principles that we can apply to God's Word to speak into these particular issues. And so what we're going to try to do this morning and over the next seven Sundays together is see how does God's Word and how does the Gospel speak into these issues? How should we allow the Gospel to speak into these particular issues that sometimes can be elephants in the room? We know they're there. We talk about them in other places. But sometimes, for whatever reason, we maybe we're afraid. Maybe we are a little concerned. We don't know. Can we talk about it? Can we not? We don't talk about those particular issues in church. So we want to dive into some of these over the next seven weeks. Then we dive in. And by the way, too, I love to do expositional sermons. By and large, I like to preach the books of the Bible. That helps us as we just kind of methodically work our way through God's Word together. Uh, and we usually will cover a lot of different subjects as we do that. But from time to time, we want to take a pause and do topical messages. And so we're going to do that this summer. In August, I've been asked over the last year, people said, multiple people, can you do a series on the family again? Talking about moms and dads and kids and the family, a husband and wife. And so we're going to do that in August, a five-part series. Then in, and then September, we're going to launch a new series called Momentum. Uh, we're going to take our entire church through financial peace. Uh, what we've learned is talking about in one of our Vision 2020 notes was we want to see create a culture of generosity. But one of the things we've talked about and we've learned is that a lot of people are being crushed by the load of debt. 
And a lot of people don't know how to get out of that or how how I got into it. How do I get out of it? And so we're going to take our whole church through financial peace uh, together in our life groups. We're going to do a small, uh, short sermon series at the end of that. But it'll start in September. Brian Riles is going to lead that effort. There'll be a team to do that. And so we'll be starting that. So it's going to be a lot of great things on the horizon for us. We're going to talk about uh, the next seven Sundays just quickly. Then I want to dive into our topic this morning. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about addictions. I would originally planned to do it this particular Sunday, but the guests that I had lined up could not come this Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, I'm going to have, and I'm going to have four of these over these next message series. I'm going to do some interviews with some folks, and I've got a, a couple, a married couple, a man and a wife, uh, who some of you may know that lives in our community. Actually, it's a member of another church in our area. Uh, they're going to come and talk about drug addictions and what it's done to their family, and he is on the other side of that, and what God's doing in their life. The next Sunday, uh, June the 30th, and we're going to talk about suicide and hope. Uh, my cousin, uh, my second or third cousin, uh, his son took his life two summers ago, a teenager, the day Super Summer started uh, for uh, students in Clinton, Mississippi. Um, and he and his wife, Darla, are going to come and talk about what that means. And so that's going to be a powerful moment together. We're going to jump into the topic uh, of abortion and talking about that. I've got a special guest that's going to talk about that who's walked that road. The next one is going to be on homosexuality and gender identity. You pray. I think I have somebody uh, that's going to line up. It's going to be a testimony. It's going to be powerful. Is this microphone blowing, Michael? Can I hear it blowing? Is it just my hearing myself? It's okay. You don't hear it? Well, good. Then I'm going to stand right here then. (laughs) So, um, homosexuality and gender identity, our culture is speaking about that. What does God's Word say about that? How, how, do we, how do we talk about this particular issue? So we're going to dive into that. So these next four Sundays, I want to ask you to pray for myself or Chris. Chris is helping with this message series. He's going to preach one of those. We're going to team teach a couple of them together. So be praying for us because I want to tell you, these are heavy, heavy topics. And we want to present them as the gospel would speak into them as what the God's Word says. Not what we think or what our feelings or opinions are, but what God's Word says, right? But I want to talk about this morning about depression and anxiety and mental illness, and what that means for your life and mine together. Um, how is that possible? Wow, my notes got all messed up here. We will talk about uh, those particular topics together. So if you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Psalm verse 34, and also Psalm 73. Psalm 34, and then Psalm 73. I want us to look at together here in just a moment. As you're turning there, I want to talk to you about this idea of of mental illness and anxiety and depression. These are all different things. And I've on your outline, I've listed to you four different websites that give you tons of different resources. This one is from Saddleback. If you remember, Rick and Kay Warren's son uh, committed suicide several years ago. And uh, I think it's been four or five years ago. They've got a massive document that just a link on there you can put in. We'll try to put it on our website this week. It talks about all the different mental illnesses that are there. It's kind of just a flyover look at that, some resources, all of those. There's over 200 different mental illnesses, right? And we use that word, we think automatically somebody that is, let's use this word, somebody will say is crazy, right? But there's all kinds of different mental illnesses, all the way from ADHD is considered a mental illness, all the way to other kinds of illnesses like bipolar or schizophrenia or or depression, those kinds of issues that are prevalent in our culture. Listen to what it talks about it's the most recent survey statistics. One in five adults in the U.S. experience a mental illness in a given year. That is 46.6 million Americans. Approximately one in 25 adults, 11 million, experience a serious mental illness in a given year that substantially interferes with or limits one or more of major life activities. Listen to this one. One in five students aged 13 to 18, 21% of them have experienced a severe mental disorder at some point in their life. And for children 8 to 15, it is estimated to be at 13%. 1.1% of adults in the U.S. live with schizophrenia. That's 2.4 million. 2.6% of adults live with bipolar disorder. That's 6.1 million. 6.9% of adults in the U.S., 16 million, had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. 18% of adults in the U.S. have experienced an anxiety disorder such as P- PTSD, Obsessive compulsive disorder and specific phobias. That's another 42 million people. And among the 20 million in adults who experience a substance abuse disorder or addiction, we're going to talk about next week, these are going to tie together, 50% of those had a co-occurring mental illness, right? These are shocking statistics if we think about them in our world. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States of people among the ages of 15 to 44. Now, we take this in a teenage world, right? 
recent stats, 7 in 10 teenagers, according to a recent uh, Pew Research Center survey, said that anxiety and depression are a major problem among teenagers today, according to them. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health recorded a rise in depression among teens in recent years. In 2016, 12% of those experienced a major depressive episode in the past year, while depression led to a severe impairment for 9% of teenagers. According to the National Survey of Children's Health, in 2016 to 17, found that 7% of children aged 3 to 17 had an anxiety disorder. Now, what's interesting to note about how awesome our world is and how great the United States is and how wonderful things are, in a general social survey, happiness among young adults 18 to 34 fell to an all-time low. Only 25% of those age groups reported that they're very happy. Now, I wanted to set this at the backdrop. A lot of stats I just threw at you, but the bottom line is this. This is a common thing, and I guarantee if I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you have been affected, either yourself personally or a family member or friend, has one of these three issues, a mental illness, an anxiety and depression, or part of those, I would almost guarantee you everyone in the room would raise their hands. Some stats say that in only any given day, 51% of Americans are receiving some sort of psychotic medication of some kind for anxiety, for depression, for all kinds of things. That number has skyrocketed in recent decades. So it's something we've got to talk about. What does God's Word say about this? Is it a bad thing? Should we be ashamed of people like that? Is it a sin? What does God think about those things? So I want us to briefly, and I'm going to hit some highlights, folks. There's a lot here that I will not have time to cover due to the heat and due to the amount of content. I've got a lot here, but I want to do my very best to try to speak. What does God say about these particular issues? So Psalm 34, let me read this one to you together, and then we'll flip to Psalm 73. Listen to what it says in verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Or this translation says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Psalm 73, would you flip over there? Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26 and also verse 28. Listen to what it says here. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all of your works. In Psalm, we really, the book of Psalms, we really can see people, David and others who wrote, struggled with some of these issues we would call perhaps today anxiety or depression. Or maybe fear, or maybe incredibly deep sorrow and despair. We find it there. The Bible says that Paul says, my heart, or David says, my heart and my flesh fail. You ever come to a place in your life where your heart and your flesh fail? Man, you want to do the right thing. You wanted to rise up above your circumstances, but you just couldn't. That your, your heart failed within you. Your flesh, your, your mind, your heart, your soul, it failed. Can I just give you a fresh word out of the gate? It's okay. We look at biblical examples in the Bible of people who suffered and struggled with issues like these. We talked about Hannah, a mother who could not have any children. The Bible seems to indicate for a year she cried all the time. She was incredibly, we would have said probably clinically depressed. She wept. She was sorrowful over her condition of her life and where she found herself you can talk about Elijah, the prophet, the great prophet of God who was used in one moment, a great moment. The next moment, he is running for his life and ready to take his own life or asking God to take his life. We can talk about Jonah. You can talk about the prophet Jeremiah. You can talk about David. You can talk about Job. You can talk about people that Jesus met when he was here on this earth who no doubt had mental illnesses and those who suffered from these kinds of things we talk about this morning. And the great news is he healed them from these things. Jesus didn't condemn anyone. Instead, he came to heal those who were lost. He said, I'm the great physician. I'm here to heal those who are sick and are in need of a physician. So, does the Bible speak into this issue? Absolutely yes. It talks about God being near to those who are crushed, who are struggling through these kinds of issues. And folks, it's prevalent. It's everywhere in our world. So, I want to ask a couple of questions, kind of some big questions. Highlight things. What do, we, what do I do if I'm struggling with depression and anxiety or some kind of mental illness or I know somebody this? What do I do? 
We're going to talk about that. Five steps everybody can take, no matter where you find yourself in life today. How do we help other people? What does the church need to do? I'm going to close with three final thoughts. And I'm going to again hit the highlights of what is here this morning, right? What if I'm struggling with depression or anxiety? What do I need to do? How do I handle this particular issue? Here's a couple of thoughts. Number one, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Now that seems to go without saying, seek the Lord. You're like, well, Brad, no kidding. I need to seek the Lord. And that's not rocket science, right? And that's not really rocket science. I know I need to seek the Lord and I've tried to seek the Lord, but it's hard. Let's be honest. Sometimes when we're in these moments of our lives, depression or anxiety or, or really, really struggling mightily, sometimes it's hard, isn't it, to seek God. Our flesh doesn't want to seek God. Our spirit does, but sometimes our flesh does not. And so the question is, what do we do? The Bible says, call upon the Lord and he will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Jeremiah 33, 3. I encourage you, whether you feel like it or not, you seek the Lord. The Lord is the ultimate answer for every problem that we're going to talk about over the next seven Sundays together. And for that matter, any issue and anything that you face, the bottom line place where we have to start is with Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, our healer. That is where we have to start. The Bible says we will seek him. We seek him. When we seek him, guess what? He will be found by us. Now, God is not playing some kind of cosmic hide and go seek with us. God says, when you seek me, you'll find me. I will be there. We need to seek him. When we're in these moments, when we find ourselves struggling with anxiety, or depression, or PTSD, or, or some of these other physical and mental issues, we seek the Lord secondly we seek to understand some particular things. We need to seek to understand where we are, right? Who we are, and how we got where we are, right? Who you are, where you are, and how you got where you are, right? And there's five things to think about just quickly to help us understand those things. First of all, your chemistry, right? Your chemistry, your chromosomes, your DNA, how you were created by God, right? Now, here's the thing. Some of us, when we were born... We all have unique DNA. Some of us have high pain tolerances, right? Like, like women in large have a much higher pain tolerance than men, right? They can birth babies. Men cannot, right? Because we just don't have that kind of pain tolerance typically, right? Some of you have high pain tolerance. My wife had one of our children naturally. I'm begging her, please get an epidural. No, like you're crazy. I don't know what your problem is, right? High pain tolerance level. Some of us don't have that. Some of us um, are... Are, are, are really high energy people. Me, I'm kind of a low energy person. I'm kind of low energy kind of person, right? Someone that has nothing to do with who you are. It's just the structural and chemical weaknesses in your body. We live in a fallen world, right? Some of us wear glasses. Some of us can see perfectly fine. Some of us hear great. Some of us don't hear so great. Some of us need uh, help in other areas. We all have some kind of biological or chemical deficiencies that can create physical problems, emotional problems, and even mental problems. For example, if you have a low thyroid. It doesn't matter how many things you try to do, you're still going to have low energy. If you have brittle bones, you're low on calcium. You can think about it, but you're going to have to take calcium. You've got to do something to treat it. So I want you to think about it. There is no... There is nothing, no flaw or sin or shame in the fact that how you are wired physically. In your biology, your chemistry, right? It's how you're wired. Mental illness is no different than physical or emotional illness. Most of the time, it is a chemical basis, right? It is a chemical basis. We're becoming to discover and understand how those things work together. So, it's kind of like this. Uh, somebody said this way. Um, you have things that are, are, are gen genetic, right? If you have a, a parent who has a, a bone disorder, or you have, when you go to the doctor and you have to answer, God bless the doctors, right? And you go, you have to answer eight bazillion questions, right? Tell us about your brothers or sisters and your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your cousins and what did they have? And what, you know, why? Because we know that it passes down, right? Those are things that we can't control. It's kind of like those blue jeans that some of us crazily pay for that have like, they are distressed, you know? Somebody like ripped them, tore them up on purpose, right? Not accidentally. Like when I was growing up, you were horrified to rip your jeans. You put patches on them. Y'all yeah, remember those days? You might, might with me on that? Good. Eight of you, the rest of you good. Okay, not the rest of you. So, um, right, remember those days, right? Now they're distressed. One of the tags in this pair of jeans says, uh, this one it says, these jeans have intentional flaws in order to make them unique. All of us have some kind of flaws in us, and they're all different. 
They're all what things that make us unique. You have in your chemistry some flaws that are there. Secondly, your connections, right? Your relationships in life. You and I are a product of the relationships that we had, especially when we were younger, right? If you're still younger, those relationships are being formed. Mom and dad, that's why it's so critical about relationships. They are, have a huge thing. Study after study, study after study, I'm going to get that out in a minute. Study after study have shown, right, that your identity is largely determined by how the important people in your life think about you. Now, for some of you, that was great. It was perfect. It went really, really well. Not perfect, but it went really, really well. They, they cared for you, right? But for some of you, you didn't have that. You missed those connections. You missed those relationships. And so as a result, it affected who you are and how you've lived your life up to this point. We have to recognize that fact. And as a result, we need to be very careful to know that the most important person in our life has to be Jesus Christ. He has to be first and foremost because what God thinks about us matters most above what anybody else thinks about us, right? But nonetheless, those relationships are important. So if you grew up feeling disconnected, guess what? You're going to have a tendency as an adult to feel disconnected and have a hard time, not always, but sometimes making relationships with other people, having meaning and purpose in your life because of the connectivity issue of your life. We don't have time. You can go back all the way to the Garden of Eden and talk about Adam and Eve where all of this began and the fall of relationships and the disconnection that's there. We're all sinners, and as a result, it causes all kinds of problems. Thirdly, your circumstances. Not only your chemistry, right, your connections. Thirdly, your circumstances. There are things that will happen in your life and mine that are different, right? We all have had different circumstances, most of which, if not all, we cannot control. You think about things in your childhood that happened to you, and maybe your teen years, maybe your young adult years. Those are circumstances that have shaped you, right? They have, you maybe have experienced rejection as a child or as a teenager. You may have experienced abuse. You may have had some crisis or catastrophe in your life. Those have a deep, profound effect on your life. Fourthly, your consciousness. We might call this your self-talk, right? Some of us do this out loud, and people think they were crazy. Others of you just do this privately, quietly to yourself, right? I usually do mine out loud, right? So if my, my boys have picked up on this. We're playing golf. I often as I hit a bad shot, which is rare, I get to play. But when I do get to play, I play. And here's what I'll usually say out loud, loudly. Brad, you bank. That's what I usually will say. Like that's going to do any good to change my golf shot. But it's better than saying something else, right? So I, I choose to do that. What am I doing? I'm self-talking. I'm saying to myself, you numbskull, why did you not realize you need to hit this way? You know how to hit the golf ball. You hit it that way. You sliced it. You whatever. You didn't hit it at all. Whatever. Right? We self-talk, right? We do it a lot more than what we realize. We tell ourselves certain things. Our consciousness influences our identity. Our habitual thoughts are many times where we find our identity. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Be careful what you think because your thoughts can ruin, or their thoughts rather, run your life. What you think about yourself. And many times what we think about ourselves are determined by what other people think about us. But here's the kicker. You can control what you think about. No doubt about it. Feelings are not facts. What you feel about yourself doesn't mean it's fact. Right? Notice the last one here. Your choices. Now here's the amazing thing. This is the one of these that we have the freedom about. Some of the other ones we don't have a lot of choice about, right? But our choices, what we do, we have a free moral choice to do right and what is wrong. One of the greatest blessings God's given us because it allows us to choose love versus choosing sin. But it's also a great curse because we can choose to do the wrong thing, right? I cannot choose my chemistry. I cannot choose my DNA, right? I cannot choose the fact I am five foot seven. I prayed for years. Oh God, just give me four more inches. Five would be perfect. If I could just be six feet tall, I'm five foot seven. I've been called strawberry shortcake since I was in the second grade. I was always on the front row. I, it's not funny at all. I'm still very wounded about that. Can you tell? My self-talk, right? Um, I wanted to be taller, but guess what? I'm not. There is nothing I can do to make me taller. Guess what? I am loud. Y'all pick that up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. God bless you. I can't hear your amens, but I know that's what you said. Right? I know I'm loud. I can't say a whole lot I can do about that. It's my personality. I'm, I'm high energy. It's how I'm wired. But the other four things, guess what? I can do certain things about those, right? Now, I can't choose what, ha what, I, what happens to my body, but I can make the most of what I have about my body, right? I, can choose, I can't choose 
I didn't choose my relationships to start with, but I can choose how I respond to them. I didn't choose my circumstances, but I can choose how I respond to them. I didn't even on my conscience, I can't control what people say about me, but I can choose to not believe what they say to be true. So folks, if we're going to talk about this issue of, of, of anxiety and depression and mental illness, we need to understand those five things about ourselves, right? And if you've never taken time to do that, I want to talk about this third one that connects is to seek help. Seek help. There is nothing wrong. I grew up in an era where I remember the very first counselor we ever heard of. In the church, to go to counseling was almost like a weakness, like it was like a, a stigma, right? My home church in First Baptist Jackson was one of the very first churches in the entire United States to hire a pastor of counseling. They started a, a, a ministry, counseling ministry called Summit Counseling back in the day. And I want to tell you something. It was a vital factor in this young man's life. I came to, at 17 years old, understand some very disturbing things about my life, and I needed some counseling. Folks, we need to be careful to understand there are good, solid, Christian-based counselors who can help us process these five things. Now, sometimes we can do it our own. We can work through some of these things on our own. But I want to encourage you, do not be afraid to seek professional help. And by and large, that's not going to be your pastor. Right? I want you to know up front, I am a horrible, terrible counselor. Here's why. I talk too much. Okay? I want to give pastoral advice. I'm not a good listener. I don't do well with saying, so what I hear you saying is, I don't do that very well. That's not even hardly my vocabulary. I, I, I wish it was. It needs to be more of it. I'm not making an excuse. It's just not my gift. Right? And listening to people very long for about two hours or three hours. If I had three counseling appointments back to back when I come home, I am just destroyed. It just wipes me out. It's just not my gift. But there are people in our community, they have this gift. And other places, and we can refer you to places where you can get professional help. Notice this last one here. Seek surrender. Seek surrender. Um, there's a great book, and I mentioned it here, Freedom from Anxiety and Depression by Mike Marino. It's a great resource book. It's about 10 chapters. It's not a very long read. If you know somebody or you are struggling in particular with anxiety or depression, he talks about these things that we have to surrender. And I just don't have time to go into these. You'll have to check it out in the book. It's really great stuff, but time is just going to leave me. What are five steps everybody can take? What are five steps everybody can take? Quickly, number one, choose to get healthier. Connecting back to the ones we just talked about, choose to get healthier. There are things that you can do physically, mentally to get better, right? There are things that you can control. You can improve on the controllables and let go of the uncontrollables in your life. So some of you need to go to a doctor, right, and get some physical checkup, right, blood work. Now, I know, listen, I know, before you ever start, listen, I know, I hate going to the doctor. My wife really hates going to the doctor. As far as she's going to every doctor, is like, she hates doctors, right? And she's terrible and worse than I am. I know we don't want to go wait in the waiting room. We don't want to pay the copay, right? But some of us have issues, and some of it we don't realize they're physiological issues. If I stood a physician up here, I promise you, I could, I could stand Dr. Harvey up here. I don't know who else we got here. Uh, doctor, I could stand you up here, not longer, unless Dr. Harvey, I'd be Dr. Dillon, right? But, Doctor, I could stand you up here, and you would tell me without a shadow of a doubt, there are many people who have mental and anxiety issues that are physically, physiologically related, right? And if you got a checkup, there's ways they could deal with those issues, right? So control the things you can control, right? Secondly, choose to deepen your relationships. Now here's the problem. Here's the problem with this issue because anxiety and depression and mental illnesses want to cause us to do the exact opposite, to isolate ourselves, to get away from people, to, to stay away because relationships for many folks were bad and not good. So now I'm not going to pursue those things because they were difficult in my past. I will stay far away from them. I've been hurt in the past and they say, I can control that part. Nobody's going to hurt me again. And so everybody, there are no off limits. I got a wall up and you don't get there. The only problem is that's not biblical. This is not biblical. It's not what the church is called to be. It's not, it's not what community is. You can't create community with everybody having a wall around them, right? And the, a lot of times the problems of people not wanting like relationships is we're afraid, right? We're afraid of what's happened in the past. But fear is illogical, right? So much more to talk about. Thirdly, choose to trust Christ no matter what happens. No matter your circumstances, no matter where you've been, no matter what has happened, you and I can make a choice to trust Christ. Christ and even say out loud, God, I don't like this. I don't understand this. I'm struggling. I'm in a pit. I'm in a hole. I'm in a dark cloud. I feel like I've been there for years. But Lord, I choose to trust you. 
No matter what is happening. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. You may be a product of your past. Listen to me carefully. You may be a product of your past, but you do not have to be a prisoner of it any longer. For some of you today, I have prayed this week as we embark on this message series that God would free some of you, even in the blistering heat today, that God would free some of you from the past you walked in with, that you could walk out and say, I will no longer allow my past to be and keep me a prisoner. You can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit of God this morning. Next, you can choose what you think about, right? I cannot choose what people say about me or think about me, right? I can't. I can't do that. But one thing I can control, right, is what I allow into my brain. I can choose how I respond to those things that people say to me, what I allow in there. See, we're creating memories. Anybody ever seen the movie Inside Out? You know, I'm talking about this, I guess it's a Disney movie or Pixar movie, I don't know. Great movie, funny, funny movie. It's really great. It talks about all the five emotions, and it's really great. I, I hope they do come up with a second one, because I'd love to see adults' versions of this, um, of what we're really thinking sometimes, right? And so sometimes anger gets a hold of it, right? You know, it, I didn't see the, the adult version of this when men are driving down the interstate. You know, the anger gets the button, you know. That might have happened to me yesterday. But anyway, so we get these things. They make memories, right? And it's all these synapses. There's been all this kind of incredible brain research that our incredible God created in our, in our brain. But it creates memories, right? But here's the thing. We can change how we think. Now, we talked about in younger years how the brain is formed. It's really, really critical. It's why we're involved in Excel by 5 and trying to share the gospel with kids and families early because it's so critical these early years. But let me tell you something. Even though... Even though they may experience these things, God can transform the heart and the mind of any person who is willing. No matter what they've experienced, no matter what they've walked through, God can do a transformative work. Romans 12, 2 talks about the transforming work that God does. You and I must feed our brain with truth. Whatever we feed our brain with, garbage in, guess what comes out? Garbage out. Let me encourage you to something this morning. Your joy is a choice. Some of us this morning need to stop blaming everybody else for our unhappiness. We, you and I can be as happy and as joyful as we choose to be and believe. Philippians 4.8 says, fix your thoughts, your mind on what is true, honorable, and right. What the enemy wants to do is to fix your mind on the negative, on the depressive, on the hard, on the things that were not fair, all the things of the past, right? He wants you to fixate on that. And Christ says, Paul says, Fix your mind on the things of God, that which is right and honorable and true and perfect and lovely. Fix your mind on these things. You can, by the power of God, rewire your brain. Lastly, choose to Jesus to be your Savior every day. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, preacher, theology here. Whoa, whoa, time out. You're saying I got to choose Jesus every day to be my Savior? No, there's a one-time moment you ask Christ to be the Savior of your life. But listen, you and I must make a mental choice every day to be full of the Spirit of God. We talked about it last week in Galatians, right? We're being full of the Spirit of God and those things that come out of that. I must make a daily choice to surrender my heart and my life for Him to save me. Jesus, I need you to save me from my chemistry, from my past, from my physical and emotional and mental defects that I struggle with, right? My relationships, my trauma, my trouble from all those things that are there, right? God can do those things. So how do we help others? If you're struggling, those things I pray are going to be so helpful and practical for you. But let me ask you, some of you say, well, I'm not really struggling with any of those issues, right? Some of us by nature are not depressive people. Some of us are always the glass half, what, full, right? Right? When I go to the doctor, I always like to go to a doctor with a glass half full. I don't like the half empty people, right? There are always people to tell you, yep, I'll never forget. But a doctor, I think I may mention a few weeks ago, my dad uh, first got diagnosed with cancer years and years ago, kidney cancer, and he walked in and he, here was his take on it, right? Um, this was like when I was, this back in like the early, late 90s. And he came in and he said, yep, he's got kidney cancer, it looks really bad, I'm not sure he's going to make it. That's how he said it. I mean, he didn't like say, let me sit down a minute, let me talk to you about it, just bam, right? My mama passes out. I wanted to hit the doctor and kill him. Like, could you have said it a little different way? Good night, right? The other guy, his other partner comes and says, oh, you know what? It is, it is serious, but I think we'll be able to handle it. I'm like, I like the half full guy. Don't let the negative guy tell him he can't come to the room. He is like banished. We want the happy guy, right? I like the happy guy, right? Some of us by nature, we don't, we're not wired that way. Necessarily. Some of us are wired in that way. We don't see things from 
the upper perspective. We tend to see the So what do we do? How do we help other people? Number one, listen to them. And this is hard for us to do in our culture, right? And listen to me carefully. <laughs> listen to them, listen to me carefully, right? Not on social media. Face-to-face, I know this is old school, face-to-face interaction and listening to people's stories. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a past. Everybody has hurts and hang-ups. Everybody in this room. As a pastor, I know what a lot of those who are in this room, I know a lot of you, and know, I don't know all of you, but a lot of you, and I know where some of your hurts and hang-ups, and some I don't have a clue, and you have them. What do we need to do to people? Listen to them. Don't try to tell them what to do. Just let them share their story with you. Let them share where they are. Let them share where they're struggling with you. Listen to them. Secondly, pray with them and for them. Like right then and there, on the phone, in a coffee shop, in the hospital, Prayer is not a supernatural, special, pastoral gift only. Did y'all know that? Did you know that I'm not the only person that can go to the hospital and pray over a sick person? Did y'all know that? Look, I know that. Isn't that awesome? Did y'all know this is huge, right? Because, you know, I don't know if y'all know or not, but I put on my special super Jesus suit when I go to the hospital. And I have a special prayer. And I got a little prayer cloth that I sneezed in. I'm going to lay on people's hands. You know, I, I got all this special stuff. I don't. I'm just like you. So wherever you are and the people you encounter in your family, pray with them. Pray God's healing over them. Pray for God's mercy over them. Pray for God to deliver them. Pray for God to give them hope. Pray over them and then pray for them after the fact. Don't ever underestimate the importance of prayer. Thirdly, encourage them. Especially when they're struggling these issues, check on them. Don't just check on them and say, they say, oh, pray for me. I'm really struggling with depression. And a month later, I'm going to check on them. That didn't work. Hey, let me encourage you, the body of Christ, though the preacher tries to keep with everybody and I try to juggle all the balls, I, I always drop somebody. I don't mean to and I get 47 text messages and one gets to the bottom and I miss it. And I don't mean to and I don't want to and I try really super hard. But you know what? The body of Christ together, we can pray with each other. We can listen to each other and we can encourage each other. Right? Help them get professional help if they need it. Encourage them. Go get some help. You need some help. Go get it. I'll get you there. I'll help you find somebody. Encourage them to get professional help if they need it. Lastly, get them connected to a church and a small group. They need to be in relationship. Even if they just sit there and they're quiet, they can be in relationship to start with and be with a group of people who can love them and surround them. Lastly, what does a church need to do? And I'm trying to hurry. I'm talking really fast, I know. What does the church need to do? Number one, remove the stigma. Remove the stigma. Folks, we've got to not let people think that the church thinks people with mental illnesses or depression or anxiety, any of these kinds of things, that there is a sin. Now, are there sinful choices that we make that do cause some of the problems that we have? Absolutely, yes. There is no doubt about it. But there are many times when somebody has done nothing wrong, but chemically, they have issues mentally and, and socially and emotionally that are not a product of anything they have done. So we've got to remove the stigma and say, you know what? It's all right. We, you're loved here. One of the things I love when I got here, we had some, some guys that live up uh, there that were coming for several, several years. Gary Ford and a couple of men were a part of that. I mean, our church loved on these guys when they were here for a season, right? They had some mental issues. We loved on them. So what the church should do, remove the stigma. Be willing to talk about it. Let's not walk into a life group, into church, and you've got an issue and fake it. Tell somebody. Church, let's make it a place where people can come to this altar and say, I am struggling with this issue. I need people to pray over me. I need people to love me and encourage me. What does the church need to do? Raise awareness. This is an issue. We've got to talk about it. Just talking about it helps raise awareness. Thirdly, we must be equipped and educated. We don't know what this all looks like, but at some point we've got to figure out how can we minister in Christ's name to those who are struggling with these kinds of issues. We've got to support those who struggle. And lastly, we must remind them of the hope that you and I have in Jesus. Three final thoughts. Number one, for those of you who are struggling with any of these issues, your illness, whatever it may be, is not your identity. When a person goes to an AA group, they will often start and they will say it this way, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Brad Eubank and I'm an alcoholic. Okay? I love what the Celebrate Recovery, which is something I'll mention too, is offered at 
Carterville Baptist Church is offering a, a night class at 4.30. Venture Church offers one, I think, at 6. You can be a part of those. They have all kinds of different groups that meet. Here's the way those groups are started. Hi, I'm Brad Eubank. I'm a follower of Jesus who happens to have a problem with alcohol. It's an identity, isn't it? We need to understand who we are. If we know Christ as Savior and Lord, we are in Jesus Christ. That is what defines you. Secondly, you're created by God and God does not make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. Thirdly, you matter and you are valuable to God. You matter and you are valuable to God. Let me close with the scripture and then I'm done. Thank you for listening. I know it's been hot and I don't think I saw but like five people go to sleep. Just kidding. Psalm 27 verse 13. Listen to what it says. I would have despaired. When you put in some circumstance in your life, I would have despaired in this particular moment in my life, situation in my life, circumstance in my life, where I am right this moment. I would have despaired, been depressed, fallen into the pit of depression and anxiety and all of those things that can happen, some of which are circumstance-based, some of which are chemically-based, whatever the case may be. I would have despaired what? Unless... I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There are people who are not living in the land of the living. They're living in the land of the dead. Verse 14, what do we do? Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. What did you pray me this morning?